get Microsoft Access today. So how many of you out there have used Microsoft Access to any degree? Got a few over here in the back. There's one. How many of you have not ever used Access? Man, there's a bunch of you that really aren't sure. This is a point in the course where the playing field gets leveled. So you came into the class, and I asked, how many of you have ever used Excel? And I saw probably two-thirds of the class raise their hand. And I would guess that probably there were maybe a dozen or two more that didn't raise their hands, but probably should have raised their hands. So most of you had had some experience with Excel. And that has an effect of being comforting for those of you who knew Excel, and scary for the ones who didn't, because the ones who didn't think, oh gosh, I'm really far behind. What you find with Access is that most of you don't know anything about it. And, and that can feel comforting because you're all kind of in the dark together. I have found something in the past 15 years that's very, very interesting, and it has to do with Access versus Excel. How many of you absolutely hate Excel? If you never, ever saw it again, you would be a very happy person. In fact, if a genie could grant you three wishes, abolishing Excel might be one of them. All right, how many of you hate it almost that much? Okay. Uh, those of you who really have strong negative feelings towards Excel tend to really like Access. I don't know what it is. Access is a completely different way of thinking. And uh, at this point in the semester, I tend to find that people who struggled a lot have renewed confidence that, whoa, I can do this, because here's a program I can understand. Now, don't get me wrong. There are people who really hate Excel and really hate Access, too. So I can't guarantee you that you're going to love it if you hated Excel. This also means many times the people who seem to be naturals with Excel, you know, the people that sit somewhere around you and they always seem to have the answer when you're working on the in-class exercises. It's like they, just, they just, just know what the answer is. You don't even know where they got it from. Those people have a harder time. And in some cases, the people who struggled with Excel are helping along or, or kind of teaching concepts to the people who used to be really, really good at Excel. So it, it does, it can look really interesting at this point in the semester. All right, so we are going to look at Access, and, and we're going to go a little bit slower with Access because, again, most of you have never seen it, and, and many of you are almost afraid that you're walking into an uncertain death. Databases, oh my gosh, that sounds very scary. It's not scary. Database software is just a program that's designed to handle a lot of data, a lot of stuff. And you've seen databases before. You've seen electronic databases before. In fact, you interface with one, I'll bet, every single day. And whether or not you knew it, that's a different story. We are going to make a distinction here between data and information. Data is just a collection of numbers and or text. If I were to throw on the screen at the beginning of class, just the numbers that you see there, 273459368. Just put those numbers up there and say, what do you think? Well, you'd probably have not much of a feeling one way or the other. I just threw a bunch of numbers up there, and you don't really know what it means. You don't know what it is. It's data. If I tell you what that data means, if I tell you that it's my social security number, which would be kind of dumb for me to do that, but anyhow, if I did, you're able to derive some meaning from that set of numbers, and it becomes information. So we are going to be looking at the distinction between the two. With databases, we're looking at software that can handle a vast amount of data, and it's the meaning that's derived from that data that makes it information. So databases are large collections of data stored in a well-defined format. There are lots of different kinds of databases out there, uh, and they, they can operate on a very different fundamental level. Access is known as a relational database management system. And by relational, we mean that the objects that we're going to create in Access, the objects that house the data that we're keeping track of, will be related to each other through common links, through common data. So it's a relational aspect of Access that makes it a relational database management system. Uh, there are some types of databases that you've hopefully seen, electronic filing systems, repositories for large amounts of information, AKA search engines. So if you're going to look for something on the web and you go to Google and you use the search box to type in a search term or a couple of search terms, you're asking a giant search engine whether or not it has anything related to what you're looking for. So on a, on a daily, maybe even an hourly basis, you interface with the search engine. But there were databases long before there were computers. If a database really is 
uh, something that is able to store vast amounts of data and also has some uh, ways of helping retrieve that data for the user when they want to look at something very specific. Not all of the data, I don't want to see the whole thing, I just want to see a, a little subset of that population. There are ways, there are manual types of databases that we've seen over time. And I, I worry that the longer I teach this, the more these examples won't be relevant. But how many of you have ever seen a phone book? Hoping most of you have still seen a phone book. Uh, usually they get dropped off at your house about every year or two in a big plastic bag. And it's this huge, massive book that keeps track of all the people in your community, in your city usually. And if a person wants to be found, wants to be known about, so it means they're listed in the book, you will be able to find the person's first name and last name, their address, and their telephone number for anyone who is listed in your community. Now that book by itself holds lots of data. That's, that's a wealth of information there, especially when we can derive some meaning from it. Imagine if that book did not have the user's names in alphabetical order. So here we still have this book. Imagine they're all in random order. We still have all the names and the addresses and the phone numbers, so that data is still there. But your ability to retrieve something that you're looking for, it's almost impossible. Or imagine that the user, the person using the book, doesn't understand what the system is for going in and systematically finding a person that they might be searching for. So all of a sudden, the storage aspect of that manual database is there, but the retrieval piece is not. And that's one of the most important aspects, is being able to retrieve what you need. Uh, a dictionary is also another good example of a manual database. So having a book that has like an unabridged English dictionary, has every word in the English language, you could go in and find the, the spelling, the pronunciation, the definition, plurals. Uh, but if those words are all in there in random order, that's pretty meaningless to you. Being able to find what you need in there would be almost impossible. So some computer databases might include databases that the Ohio State University uses to keep track of all of its students, its faculty, its buildings, um, the courses that are offered, the payments that you have made for your tuition, uh, fees that have accrued for the classes you've signed up for so that balance statements can be sent out to you. All of that is kept track of. Another example might be insurance companies and the ways in which they keep track of their policyholder information. If you work, your employer probably has a database that keeps track of not only you and the hours that you've worked and what they've paid you, but depending on what it is you do for a living, there's probably a database aspect to uh, the products that you might be selling or the services that your company offers. We've been in the Excel frame of thinking for a really long time now, and it may be difficult to step back and get out of that frame of thinking. So I do want to compare and contrast Excel and Access here for just a few minutes. So with Excel, we were looking at a program whose main asset was data analysis, and we saw a lot of support for the analysis of data. We saw a lot of complex functions that allowed us to go in and efficiently and effectively crunch numbers. And you learn probably 30 different functions, and we know that there are hundreds more available in Excel. In fact, one of the things I'd like to do if we have time at the end of the semester is to teach you how to create your own custom functions in Excel. So if those several hundred pre-programmed functions weren't enough for you, you would know how to go in and create some new functions on your own if you'd like. So if we have time at the end, that's one of the things I'd like to do. But that's really the thing that Excel's good at. We saw some support for that complex analysis, the creation, the easy creation of charts and graphs. We'll look at pivot tables towards the end of the semester. So data analysis, access, is not great with data analysis. We're not going to be learning tons and tons of functions that will allow us to crunch numbers. If I were going to show you two pieces of software that essentially did the same exact thing, that would seem to be a waste of your time, right? So you would expect that we'd spend a lot of time on a program that does one thing, and as we focus our attention to a different program, it ought to do something different. And so access is going to be able to efficiently handle lots and lots of data. Now the truth of the matter is, there's some overlap with what these two programs do. So even though Excel's really good at data analysis, there are features available in Excel that handle data. There are database-like features right in Excel. And Access, I said it doesn't have a lot of support for calculations, but it does have some support. We will see some calculations in Access, but not to the extent that we saw them in Excel. 
Another thing that's important to know is that these two programs work really well with each other. And frequently, you will create queries in Access, and I'll, we'll talk about what queries are, but you'll be creating some things in Access that might need that additional complex analysis support from Excel. And you can take that data straight from Access and put it over into Excel. And you can also take data from Excel and put it into Access. Because frankly, when you when I asked how many of you had used Access before, very few of you raised your hands. Even when you leave this class, there may be inevitably some of you who feel much more comfortable still with Excel because you knew it before you came in. There are people who haven't used Access a lot, and although they're creating things that really should be in a database, they weren't comfortable enough to do that, and so they used the database features of Excel to create something. And at first, maybe it was a smaller type problem. Maybe it was a smaller uh, set of data. I mean, the, the features in Excel that are database features, they're watered down. They don't work well with the, the vast amounts of data that Access can handle. And they're not nearly as precise or powerful tools. So if you don't need the powerful to tools and you've got a smaller set of data, you will find that some people have really managed to keep data in Excel for a very long time, but over time, uh, sometimes the needs, the, the company will grow, and the needs uh, for that data support outgrow what Excel can do. And you have to move stuff from Excel into Access. And it's very, very easy to do. It's one of the things we'll look at through the semester. So creating a database, we're going to be using Microsoft Access. Uh, I would caution you for the labs, for those of you who have been working on pre-lab assignments from home, if you haven't already double-checked the version of Microsoft 2010 that you have, if you have the standard version, you probably don't have Microsoft Access. And you don't really want to wait until two hours before a lab is due to figure that out. Also, most Mac users, you're, you're not going to find, um, you're not going to find an Access program on your computer. So you do want to double check this to give yourselves plenty of time to uh, either make arrangements to go work from Caldwell or find someone who does have the program. Oh, and I was going to say, uh, there are lots of other types of databases out there. Oracle is one that you've probably heard about quite a bit. And that's a, a much more powerful database program than Access is. And it's something that would be used more uh, with mainframe computers where there's a need to be keeping track of, of millions of, of records and looking at lots and lots of processes and transactions that are taking place. And with database programs, there can be a fundamentally different way in which data is organized and retrieved. I said that with Access, it's a relational database management system. But there are other database management systems that operate more on an object-oriented nature, some that are hierarchical in nature. So there can be differences in the fundamental ways that database systems work, uh, but for the most part with uh, Sybase and SQL Server, a lot of what you're going to learn here with Access can be carried over into processes that these databases also use. So we're going to look at the database window. We're going to go into Access, and I do want to spend just a little bit of time looking at what's there because it, it is a bit different than what we saw with Excel. We're going to be focusing on four different objects in Access, tables, queries, forms, and reports. We will not have the ability at all to get to or talk about program modules and macros. That is well beyond the scope of anything we could do in this class. It re would require some programming code um, and visual basic understanding in order to do that. We do want you to be aware that we're not covering everything there is to know and access. We did a lot of stuff with Excel. We left very little uncovered. And we also gave you the tools with Excel to go in and, and, and find the stuff that we haven't covered. Because you really should be real experts with Excel. But with Access, there are going to be areas that we don't get into. There are other database classes that are offered within the computer science and engineering department for those of you who are interested. So we're going to go in and take a look at Access and specifically spend time uh, talking about those four objects that I just mentioned, tables, queries, forms, and reports. <coughs> so I'm going to be opening up uh, the database called Research Papers. And I want to make sure that this is perfectly clear. <laughs> I had a problem at first with going along with this whole idea of a database with uh, research papers because I, I've been afraid that you're not going to hear what this topic is about. And with teaching the ethics course in the CSNE department, I get kind of sensitive to what people take away from what we're teaching with our examples. 
So with research papers, we're going to be looking at a database that is designed to keep track of a company that types up research papers that have already been written by students. Um, this was not an example I came up with, and I'd like to keep the example consistent to what's in the slide, so I, I'm still going to go with it, even though I have other examples uh, throughout the semester. But what you have in your book corresponds to this, so it's worth keeping this way. So this company doesn't write the papers for the students. The, stu the students aren't buying papers to turn in. They're buying the service of somebody typing up the paper that they've already written. Okay, so I'm hoping you've all heard me with this. So as I say research papers, and charges for research papers. We're talking about just the actual typing of the paper. So if you look in the title bar of this window, and I'm going to minimize what's in the background so that it's a bit easier to see, there's a title bar at the top. We saw the same thing with Excel. If you've worked with PowerPoint and, uh, and Word, you'll see the same thing, the name of the file. The type of file with database files in Access, the 2007 format is the same format as the 2010 format. The extension that you're going to see on the end of any access file is .accdb. And since that file extension is the same for both versions, frequently you're going to see in parentheses after the file name, 2007 to 2010. A person who is using something previous to 2007, and I hope there are very few people still using that version of, of uh, access, but those people would really not be able to open much of anything you would send to them from Access if it's been created in a later version. So anyhow, we see the title bar. We do see the Quick Access toolbar. We do see uh, the uh, ribbons, the tabs and the ribbons. We see a lot of different tasks and commands, and they don't look much like anything we saw in Excel. In fact, the names of the ribbons aren't like really anything we've seen in Excel. Create external data and database tools. I mean, file, the backstage view, yeah, we've seen that before. And that has all the, the similar kinds of things that we saw, like saving, opening, closing, printing. But there are some features here, too, that, that are a bit different. So sometimes I like to start with where the similarities are so you don't feel like you're looking at something so different. But there really aren't a ton of similarities between Excel and Access when we, look, when we talk about the interface, the way the program looks. So we'll get to a lot of the tasks on the ribbons later on as we start to look at these tasks. I want you to focus in on the left-hand side of the screen. We have what's called a navigation pane. And this pane allows us to take a look at those objects, tables, queries, forms, and reports that we've created in this database. I do want you to make a note in your slides. There is a drop-down menu from all access objects in the navigation pane. If you click on that, it's important that you double check what's checked off. First of all, all access objects. It is possible, depending on, usually the default in access would be to have all access objects checked, but that's not always the case. And, and what I'm going to show you up here is not always the default. So if you don't have all access objects checked off, it's possible that when you look at the navigation pane, you might only be seeing one or more of those many objects that we're going to talk about. And it may lead you to believe that those objects don't exist. So you don't want to uh, make things more difficult for yourself just because you can't see those things that are there. And the other thing you want to make sure is checked off is object type. You would like to make sure that the objects themselves are grouped by the type of object they are. So tables would be with other tables. Queries would be with other queries. And if you don't check that off, it sometimes can be very confusing to look at what's showing up under this pane. And it'll make more sense, too, as you play around with access. So sometimes I just tell you to take a note of something because it will be important later. So what I want to do is look at underneath tables. Let's pull up the client table. So in your slides, uh, you should see also the client table. So this is a, a database, again, that keeps track of this company that sells services for typing up papers. And the kinds of things that the company would need to keep track of would be the clients that have had their papers typed. And as we talk about this particular scenario, you might even start thinking about, well, wouldn't they also need to keep track of this and this and this? You may start thinking about other things that would be important to do in this database. And those are things I want you to be thinking about because right now we're looking at a limited scope of what might be used for this particular database. So there would be other things that would, be, that would need to be managed. So in the client table, and as we look at this table, it, it does sort of give us the feel of Excel. Here we kind of 
feel comfortable. Yeah, it looks like we've got cells, and it looks like we've got columns, and, and we've got rows, and maybe this is Excel. Maybe we are going to see something we've seen before. And no, it's not the case. What we have are, yeah, again, columns and rows, but what's important isn't so much each block, the intersection of a column and row. Uh, what's important is the entire row or the entire column, and I'll explain why. So as you look at the horizontal arrangement of data, so let's click just to the left of the first person's information. So this is called the row selector, and I have now selected the entire first record of data for the client's table. So horizontal arrangements of data are called records, and then vertical arrangements of data are called fields. So this is a field. So within this table, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight fields. And we have 16 records. Down along the bottom of the screen is a navigation button. This allows us to move through the records within our tables. It may seem kind of silly right now to have this navigation pane. It says records one of 16. Okay, I can see all of the records here. If I needed to navigate through the records, one of the things that you can do is simply click on next record, which is just a, a triangle that points to the right, and then one that has a triangle right pointing with a line after it, which takes you to the last record. The last option has a triangle with a star after it, a yellow star, <clears throat> and that opens up a brand new record. So if you wanted to enter in a new client into this table, you can quickly and easily do that. Now imagine this table with thousands of records, and so those buttons might take on a little bit more meaning for you in terms of making things efficient. So right now we can kind of easily click on that, that new row down at the bottom. So if I wanted to enter in a new record, I could also just click on it. I could click on that, the new row. This navigation pane is also helpful if you have thousands of records. You can also click within the window where you can specify what record you'd like to go to. So if you have 3,000 records within this table, you could type in 1,500, hit enter, and you would go right to the middle point of this table. So the navigation pane does take on more meaning when you have lots lots more entries in it. But this table wasn't something that just popped out of nowhere. If I looked at a brand new database, this is a database that we've already started, we've already put stuff in. What about one that we haven't started for you? Let's go in and open up a brand new database. And while I'm in this window, I want to point out, I'm going to open up a blank database, but you do have the ability to open up a lot of templates in, uh, in Microsoft. And this is the same thing with Excel. There are some things that are already started for you, some databases in this case that are already started for you. The tables have already been constructed. The relationships already established. Uh, now, you might be thinking, well, then why do I need to take this class if those great templates are already there? And the answer is because none of those templates is ever going to perfectly fit what you need, and you are going to make a lot of modifications to it. And if you don't really understand the essence behind what a database does, those templates, are, those templates aren't going to help you anyways. But these templates can be very helpful as starting point shortcuts for some of the projects you might work on after you leave here. So we're going to open up a blank database. And as we do, we're looking now at the navigation pane. There's nothing. I mean, it says table one, but really, table one is just a suggestion for me. It's not even really been created. All access objects is checked off, so everything should be showing up. I don't see very much. And everything would be grouped by object type, and yet I'm seeing nothing, really. So table one is just what we see here, not much. So those uh, field headings that we had across the top of the screen, they're not there because we have to create those. And I want to point out, uh, right now, I'm going to have to go back in and re-pull up the database I was using. And this is because when I am remotely logged in, I can't open up two databases at the same time. When I'm sitting at my office PC, I can open up a lot of databases at the same time. And I get used to doing that. So then when I come in here and I teach, I'm logged in remotely to my office PC. When I open up a second one, it closes out the one before it. So you'll see me do that a number of times this semester. And you can make fun of me secretly when I do that, because it is kind of funny. So anyhow, that was the client table. And we'll just look real quickly at some of the other tables that are in this database. We have one that keeps track of charges. Charges being 
when someone has a paper for us to type up, they owe us money, right? We have some sort of going rate for what a paper might cost to type. It might be based on how long the paper is. In fact, I would think that it probably is. And notice we keep track of that. We keep track of the client and the amount that they owe us, and then the date that they came in and had a paper typed up. Now, this leaves a lot to be desired. I mean, I kind of want to know a little bit more, like how many papers was that and how many pages was the paper. So we've kind of given you a simplistic database with some details missing so that we can look at some other fundamental concepts with access. But I'd like to know, how do I know which client we're talking about? I mean, I just see this client ID. If I go back to the client table, I got way more stuff to know about these clients. I can see their names, their addresses, their phone numbers. Why am I not including that same kind of information over in the charges table? What do you think? Why do I not see last name and first name here? Who just said that? Where are you? Because their IDs, what? Their IDs are unique. Yeah, but their IDs are way back over in the client table. References, yeah. So, so if I really wanted to know who the client was, not just by their ID, but their last name and their first name, I do have ways to determine that. And, and it may not be all, all that clear right now because we're looking at these separate entities of tables. And in a little bit, we're going to pull all that together and we're going to look at how these pieces make up this bigger picture. And so, yeah, even though the names are in the client table, I have a way if I want to, if I need to, to run a query, which is something we're going to be looking at. A query is a question, a way to ask a question and access where I want to look at maybe just a, a snapshot of the population. So who are those clients who have, um, you know, over $200 in charges? Who are those clients who haven't made any payments? So I can run queries to go in and find people who meet specific conditions or people who have had papers typed up on a given date. I can also run queries to pull things together. So if I wanted to find the ID, the amount, and the charge date, and the last name and the first name, later on we're going to be looking at queries as a way to pull that together. Why go through all the trouble of running a query to pull all that together? It still doesn't help me get to the essential question of why didn't I just also include the last name and the first name in the charges table? Would it really have been that hard for me to do that? I mean, when I look at this table, I don't really know the names of the clients, but I might want to. I've got to go through the process of writing a query now to get that. Is this a bad design? I mean, should we have included the last name and the first name in the charges table? What if I tell you, oh, yeah, here. Doesn't have anything to do with confidentiality, but that's a good guess. Doesn't have anything to do with that. What if I told you that one of the biggest, um, one of the biggest downfalls of a good database is wasted space and redundancy? That with any database that you're going to create for this course, if you have a lot of wasted space and a lot of redundancy, you've just killed the efficiency of your database. Does that does that give you an idea of why this might be a problem? to include last name and first name in the charges table when we can go in and find that in the client's table. So by adding in, if we did go in, and I got to tell you, there are all kinds of really inefficient things that you can do in Access. And there's no big hand that's going to come out of the computer and punch in the face and say, that was awful, don't ever do that again. That doesn't happen. You just have databases that run very inefficiently over time. So I could very, I could very easily have gone in and, and put in last name and first name in the charges table. And, and I wouldn't have gotten an instant message that said, yeah, that was dumb. So what happens is the user knows ahead of time, hey, I've got to be really careful. I want to make sure that I'm really uh, making sure that space that I use is precious. I'm not wasting it. I'm not using it on, on frivolous things. If I were to include last name and first name, then every single time someone would have a paper typed up and we would have to enter in a charge for them, it's going to take more time to put that entry in. 
So now not only do I have to put in their client ID, but, but I also need to put in their last name and their first name. So if something happens, and let's say um, Lisa Smith comes in, and she's, we've been typing up papers for her forever. She, she hates typing. She's real slow. She's just hen pecks. So she comes in. She's got tons of entries in this charges table. And then she goes and she gets married. And she changes her last name. And now we've got to go in to every single record in the charges table and fix her last name because it's different now, right? Whereas if we just would have left it in the client table when she got married, we could have changed it once, end of story. So with including things in places where they shouldn't be, which is called redundancy, like putting the last name and first name in charges. It takes up more time to enter in the records. It wastes space that doesn't need to be used. It means that when there's a change, it's going to take us a lot longer to make that change, because now we have to find all of the entries for Lisa Smith in this case. It also means that there's a chance we're going to have some major inconsistencies, because I will frequently find that if we have extra information that shouldn't be within each record, the odds of somebody mistyping something here and there means in some records, the last name and the first name fields don't always match up to what's shown in the client table. And what do you do with that? So how much do you want to have to go in and change things? You don't want to have to go in and spend a lot of time making sure people aren't making goofy errors. If we look at the payments table, so this logs all of the payments that are made by our clients, we see the same sort of structure. We see client ID, so we don't see last name, first name. We don't see address. We don't see phone number. We don't need that here, just like we didn't need it in the charges table. We see the amount that was paid. We see the payment date. And then we see something that says payment type, and we just see a bunch of numbers. I think, well, what does that mean? Well, it means we probably have the payment types defined somewhere else. So we select payment method and take a look. We do. We have a table called payment method that explains what those numbers mean. These are the four tables that we're going to look at. And I have, a, I have an extra one here called Charges 2 that I want to show you. I was talking about you know, what would be the purpose of having the last name and first name field in with the Charges table. I guess I, sh I could have shown that to you back then. I'd forgotten I did this to show you. But I meant, you know, why, why didn't we add those extra things in? And we talked about it. it would waste space, waste time, and all the, the other things that go with that. So one of the things that you might be thinking right now is, all right, well, she's got these, uh, I'm going to get rid of this for a second. She's got these four tables in there, and she's talking about eventually having to relate the tables together somehow. And that just seems like a lot of work. And once I start telling you what you have to do to relate tables together, you might even think, that's way more work than I want to have to deal with. And you start thinking, well, maybe it was possible for us to try to create one great big table, one great big table that keeps track of the client's names and addresses and phone numbers and their charges and their payments and the payment methods all at once so that we don't have to worry about these separate tables. And just like what we saw with the charges table having to include the names over and over again, if we tried to keep track of this all in one table, Perhaps um, in the client table, we would have to add on charges, payments, payment method to do that. We would end up having a lot of redundancy because every time a person would come in with a paper or make a payment, we'd have to log all of that data about them. Take a lot of time, waste a lot of space. So going back and looking now at in the client table, I talked to you about opening up a blank database. We just saw space. We, we didn't see much there. There were no column headings. And let's take a look at how I got these column headings to show up. Any table that you create has several different views that you can look at. What we're going to do is use the design triangle that you see up in the top left-hand corner of the home ribbon. If you select the drop-down arrow, you're going to see four different options. We, f we will really not use pivot view or pivot table or pivot chart view. So we're going to really be moving back and forth between data sheet and design view. And that's most common. In fact, you don't even have to go in and select it. If you toggle between uh, the design view and then what shows up next is called data sheet view, it takes you to those two most commonly used views. So basically, right now I'm in what's called, you okay back there? We didn't lose anybody, did we? No? Okay. Uh, data sheet view 
which is a view of the table with records in it, with records populated. This is called data sheet view. Design view is the behind the scenes construction of this table, what you did to create the table itself. So for us, as we look at this, what you should notice, those field names that we had all across the top of the client table, they all show up. Let me get rid of the navigation pane just so that doesn't confuse anybody. All of those field names are here. They're all there. And then I specified a data type. There are a lot of different data types that you can use for your fields and access. Text is the most commonly used data type. But some other data types would be memo. And, and memo, we'll, we'll talk about that later. It's not used that much. But maybe if I talk about the others first, it'll make more sense. Number data type is kind of what you would think of. It's a data type that's used when you are trying to uh, enter in numbers. And I would add that these are numbers that would be used in a calculation. We're going to make another distinction here in a minute. Date and time would be a field that you would use, a data type that would be used for a field that contains dates and or time. Currency would be money. Auto number is a field that is used which will automatically generate a brand new unique entry for every single record you put into a table. So auto number means automatic number. It also means automatic unique number. So if I made one of the fields within this table, an auto number, then every time I enter in a new record, a brand new unique number would be assigned to that record. And it, you can have it set from 1 to infinity, or you can have it set to randomly give a unique number. If you, had it, if you have it set from 1 to infinity, then with each record you enter, it would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And the records, the numbers that are entered there would never have a repeating auto number. And that's going to be a really great kind of field to use for what's called a primary key field, a field that needs to be unique. You'll have in your tables fields that they can't have repeating entries. They have to be unique. And auto number is a good way to establish that. The yes, no field is a field that has two options, yes or no. It's either yes or no. But it also can look like true or false, or on or off. So those, those all mean the same thing. And, and you can actually use the terminology of any of those options. But it also can look like a checkbox that's either checked or not checked. So if it's checked, it's on or true or, uh, on tr or yes. Those would be the options that would apply to a checked box. If it's unchecked, then it's off, no, or false. Um, the lookup wizard is one that we'll look at eventually. I like it. It's a really cool option. Remember in Excel when uh, I was showing you that tuition workbook? And to try to standardize entries to make sure that I didn't have 50 different ways of people entering in kindergarten or first grade or whatever, I made a drop-down box with data validation where I confined the entries that people could put into a cell to those that I predefined. And people would have to select from that. And that's really the same thing that goes on with the lookup wizard. I can set up a field where as I'm typing in a record, the options that a person can put into that field will show up in a drop-down box. And they can pick from only those options. It's a great way to standardize the entries to make sure that you don't have a ton of misspellings for city names and things like that. But it's not something we're going to look at today, but we will look at it eventually because it's very cool. <clears throat> so these data types are all data types that you have to determine which would be most appropriate for your particular fields. In the description field, this is something that would show up when you look at the data sheet view. So let's go back to data sheet view. And if I were going to enter in a brand new record, and entering in a new record is simply just typing, hitting tab, typing, hitting tab, you just tab all the way through. But notice at the bottom of the screen, this is awfully small, but it says punch out the customer. So the description that I put in for that first field shows up when someone is entering in something into that first field. Now, punch out the customer is probably not the best thing to put here. It's not all that descriptive. That, that description field would probably be better suited for, let me put it to you this way, some of these field names can be shortened. Uh, I don't really want to have really long field, field names, like first name, last name. With the naming conventions, we want to keep these short and sweet. So what we will find is that eventually you're going to be seeing like F name. And, L name, so that we can, we can squeeze more fields onto one view of this screen. And social security number is a classic example of something where if we typed out social security number for the field heading, your field width would be like this big. And the entries in it would be like this big. And if you have lots of fields in your table, 
you want to keep them small so you can see as many of them as possible in one view of the screen. So if I put SSN, that may not mean a whole lot to people, especially people who are not native English speakers. So a description field that says, enter in the client's social security number would be a description prompt that I would want to show up for a field where it just says like SSN, which may not be all that meaningful to people. So if you want to give additional instruction about what to do, that would be the way to do it. <clears throat> so we've got those data types, we've got some field properties that we're going to look at, but what I want to ask you about has to do with data types. We have a zip code field. It contains all numbers, right? Why on earth did we make it a text data type? What I'm saying is this zip code field looks like it has a bunch of numbers in it, but in access it recognizes those numbers as text. Why on earth would we do that? If we did that in Excel, Excel would go nuts. We'd see a green triangle showing up in every single cell that we did this, right? Excel would be saying, whoa, you've got a number that's stored as text. Why are you doing that? But here in Access, we're supposed to do that. <coughs> Why do you think? You know, it was right about this point in the morning class that I had this epiphany. I looked out onto a sea of people. Many of them were avoiding contact with my eyes, and the rest of them were just kind of looking like, if I could kill this lady, I would. And I'm looking at you guys right now, and I'm kind of seeing the same sort of reaction. And I can't help but think, it must be incredibly boring. It must be incredibly boring to be sitting there, isn't it? Yeah, it's boring. Remember at the beginning of the semester, I said, there's a bunch of stuff I have to teach you that's anything but exciting, right? I gotta tell you, you guys are making it maybe like 10 times more boring for yourselves. You're just sitting there like, when is she gonna jazz this up? I gotta tell you, there's not much jazz coming along. But it does seem to go faster if you take a little bit more control over your own learning. And I, and I don't see that happening. So if you're bored, if you're annoyed, and you want this to, to be a little bit easier to swallow, then, then jump into it a bit. Because that's, that's really what it takes. And actually this morning after I said that, it was, it was pretty good. I was amazed. I kind of expected they'd all probably start throwing things at me, but they didn't. So come on, think about it. You want to critically think. Challenge yourself right now. Why on earth would we want to make a zip code field? A field that has all numbers in it. Why on earth would we want to make it text? Back here. It's not an equation, it's data. When you say equation, what do you mean by that? <laughs> you're, you're on the right track. It's not that there's not an equal sign. Let's, can you add to it? There's no actual value that's assigned to the number that would ever be used maybe in a calculation, right? So if you, if you have a, an adult child who moves away from home and she goes and she opens up an account, with a bank, or she comes in and has a paper type for whatever reason, uh, you wouldn't try to guess her zip code by pulling up her mom and dad's zip code and adding those together, right? I mean, that would just be nuts. You would never do that. You would, you would never multiply a zip code by something and get anything meaningful out of that. So the zip code field is a field that would never be used in a calculation. You can think forever, and you're never going to come up with an example of a realistic reason to add, subtract, multiply, divide anybody's zip code. <clears throat> so first of all, yeah, it contains numbers, but that number will never be used in a calculation. What else? Come on, you're smart people. Home phone is text too. What, what makes you ask about that? <coughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the home phone number also is text. Wouldn't subtract two phone numbers to come up with an extra neighbor's phone number. It wouldn't make any sense. So, yeah, home phone is also the same way. So why else do you think this is? Over here. That would be with auto number, with the auto number field. If the auto number field, we would get an automatic, random, or incremental number that would be unique. 
Uh, what would happen, for example, if I had a zip code that started with a zero and I made it a text data type? Versus what would happen if I had a zip code that contained a zero, it started with a zero, and it was a number data type over here in the green. Yeah, with the, the number data type, that, that leading zero, it's just treated as nothing. If I, if I said to you, hey, I got zero 20 bucks in my pocket, you'd think, what the hell is she talking about? Zero 20 bucks? She must mean 20 bucks, but I don't know what the zero is for. When I'm talking about numbers, I wouldn't put a zero before the number and make any sense at all with that. And that's the same kind of thinking that goes along with numbers that may start with a zero, like in a zip code field or a social security number field. If we make that field a number data type and somebody has a zip code that starts with zero, that zero gets dumped. And now we have a four digit zip code. And now we're left to wonder, did somebody forget to type in one of the digits? Maybe the key was sticking? Or is that one of those starting with a zero zip codes? You don't want that kind of ambiguity because now somebody's gotta go in and figure out what it is. And once they figure out what it is, if it's still a number data type, they might try to stick a zero in and it still goes away. So that's one problem. The other problem had to do with um, if a number is never gonna be used in a calculation, and, and I wanna elaborate on that. Because with a text data type, that type of data takes up less space than a number data type in Access. So you're saving space in your database if you make a field a text data type, if you can, versus a number data type. And the reason for this is that Access assumes that the user, when they have said, yep, this is gonna be a number data type, that they evaluated, they were smart enough to know that when they made that choice, they knew that additional space had to be reserved for every record because of the potential, because of the expectation that the field will be used in a calculation. So you're saving space in little bits and pieces all along the way. You're doing little things because those little things become really big things. You have a database that has thousands of records in it, and if you're wasting, I don't know, four characters of space for every single record, you multiply that by all the records in a table, that, that gets to be enormous over time. There'll be all kinds of little things that we're gonna look at that help us save space. The other thing that will help us save some space has to do with the field properties. Now, the bottom portion of this screen will look slightly different, or even a lot different, depending on what type of data you have selected for the field that you're looking at. So with the text data type, your uh, properties will look a lot like this. Field size, format, input mask is something I'm gonna show you here in a minute, because that's kinda cool. And then we've got some validation rules and things that will help us restrict content. But if I had a number data type, so uh, let's go back just for a second, let's go to zip code. Now let's change this to a number data type, just temporarily. We're gonna undo this in a second. But we have a little bit different op set of options here. And if we specify date and time, uh, you're gonna see slightly different options versus uh, yes, no. Uh, there's a big, big difference here in some of the options. So what I want you to be aware of is depending on the data type that you're, you're selecting, the properties that correspond to that data type will be slightly or a lot different. One of the big things that you need to pay attention to has to do with field size. With a text data type, you can have up to 255 separate characters for an entry in a text data type. Uh, are you ever gonna have a zip code that is 255 characters long? I don't think so. If you don't do something about that and change the field size, that extra space gets reserved. I can change it to five. This can also be a way of standardizing some of the entries. So if you want to have just that first five digits of the zip code and not the other digits that sometimes people put after it, if you say only five characters long, then you're able to standardize the entries that are coming in so that you're not getting some with the extra digits and some without. This saves space for every single record that's gonna be put into this table. I'm now saving 250 characters for each one. But something else that's pretty cool, we look at the home phone field. And as we look at this, there are some, some characters within this field that really aren't a part of what's being stored with the entry that's placed. So the parentheses around the area code and the dash in between the numbers is a formatting 
sequence that's been put in because of a mask that we wrote. So when I go to put in a brand new record, so when I click on the home phone field in a new record, notice that that set of parentheses is already there. That dash is already there. This is formatting that's put in over the top of the numbers, whatever content is entered. This may seem like a cosmetic thing to do, but it's not. It's not solely just a cosmetic thing to do. When you have long strings of numbers, <clears throat> and if we go back into the, the design view just for a second and we take out that mask, this might be a little bit more obvious. I've taken out the formatting, and notice the numbers, they just kind of blur together. And you're looking at a potential for making mistakes. So if I don't have natural separators for numbers, like with social security numbers, the first three digits, dash, next two, dash, last four, this way of breaking down long series of numbers to help minimize mistakes. When you can build these kinds of things into your fields, you can help minimize mistakes. Your database is only as accurate as the people who have entered in your data. And if you can put little things in to help them not make mistakes, it makes a big difference. So I can go back in. And what I've done with input masks, and uh, I haven't found a book that does a really great job at explaining input masks. And so if you use the help menu, and really um, for any of these, uh, as you go through, if you just hit F1, you'll be able to get help options that go along right with whatever the property is that you're working with. You can see some of the rules for input masks, and it'll show you how to write them. And so I can put in characters for the mask that represent characters that could be entered into this field. Whether they're required or optional depends on the character I use to represent them. So if I specify a character of zero, I'm saying that uh, a person has to put in a character to represent this. And with this being an input mask, this is something that simply changes the appearance of the entry. It doesn't change the content of the phone number that's entered. It only changes the way it appears. So I could put in a set of parentheses, and those parentheses become the formatting marks that get added in. The zeros represent characters that are required. So a person wouldn't be able to put in just the first two digits of the phone number and leave the rest blank. I'm saying, you've got to put the whole thing in. And then I can put in the remaining numbers with that dash in between. So I didn't need to know anything special to do this. I just read the help menu. And then when I click out of that, access does go in and it adds a few little fancy things for me. But I really don't care because I don't have to add those in myself. I go back in and I can see that that formatting is there again. And it really does help to break up that long series of numbers. So input, input masks can be very, very helpful. Uh, <clears throat> so let's take a look as we go through here. So we talked about tables. And within tables, we have fields, which are, um, which are the vertical arrangements of data, and rows, which are records. Talked about some of the field properties. We'll get to more of these as time goes on. It's kind of a quick view of that design view of the table that we saw. And the one thing that we haven't really talked about yet is a primary key field. What does that mean? What does it do? Why is it important? Hopefully you noticed back in the design view, that there was something showing up just to the left of the client ID field. If I select the entire field by using the field selector, I can see that there's a toggle button that shows up on the ribbon, on the home, or on the design ribbon. When I unselect the primary key option, notice that the key that showed up next to the client ID field is gone. And I can place it back on the field. So, I'm specifying whether or not this client ID field is a special field in the client's table. When I say it's a primary key field, this has an effect on the properties down below. So when I uncheck it, notice indexed, which now says yes and no duplicates, will say no. So when I take off that primary key designation, it is no longer an indexed field, and it, and it doesn't say anything at all about no duplicate. So let me explain to you what that means, at least the no duplicates part for right now. When I specify that the client ID field is the primary key field of this table, I'm telling Access that I want that field to be a unique field, that I should not have any two clients in this table that share the same client ID. And that, in essence, makes the client ID field a unique field. And it's important that we have unique fields in our tables. It's the only way we're going to be able to later on 
link these tables together through common fields. So primary key fields are unique fields. They're fields that are non-repeating within a table, and they uniquely identify the records that are listed. So even if I have two, three, ten John Smiths in this client table, they should all have a unique client ID because they would all be different John Smiths. So I can always know the difference between all of my clients, even if they have the same name, and heck, even if they live in the same house because one's a junior and one's a senior. So we have to have ways of being able to uniquely identify the records in a table. <clears throat> Are there questions so far? We've talked about this. Um, we are going to look at, and this is something that's going to take us well beyond the scope of today. We're going to talk about the design of the tables and the database itself in bits and pieces throughout what we do in Access because it's not something that I can easily explain without showing you all the things that Access can do, at least all the things that we're going to cover. But I do want you to be thinking about the fact that we have this research papers company and we have chosen four tables right now to look at the data. We have a client's table charges, payments, and payment methods. Why did we go that route? Why did we, why did we break things down in that manner? Why didn't we pick some other way of breaking things down? And the truth of the matter is, and, and remember, I started to talk about the reason why we would not put all of this in just one great big table. We have a lot of redundancy, wasted space, wasted time, et cetera. So when you have a database, particular for this class, but really even as you leave here, you'll never really ever encounter a problem that's so simplistic that you only need one table to keep track of things. So what you're really going to be doing is looking at what is it that I am keeping track of? And normally the problem is going to be a larger scope, and you're going to be looking at breaking out the data in terms of smaller entities of things that are more closely related. And as you get more comfortable with this, you're probably even going to, as you create databases with more of a, a lack of structure on our part, whether it's in this class or after you leave here, you may not even realize until after you see redundancy in your database, when you start seeing that you're unnecessarily repeating things over and over again, that you probably should have defined an entity in a table separately all of its own. And we'll see those kinds of things as we look through this. How are we going to know how to break things up into separate tables? We're going to be looking at the sole purpose of making sure we aren't uh, unnecessarily repeating things that don't need to be repeated. Uh, we've talked a little bit about uh, the field size. Why would you adjust it to save space? We've talked about some of those different data types. Uh, the memo data type was one I said I explained in a minute. The memo data type. Uh, can accept text and numbers, and text field can take text and numbers too. They're both flexible fields. But the difference is the memo data type can take over 65,000 characters. It's an enormous field. And you would want to use it sparingly. This would be the kind of field that you might use for account notation. So if you work for a credit card company and somebody calls in with a concern about their account, you can hear somebody typing away you know, frantically in the background, trying to write it all down. And they'll say to you, okay, well, I'm making a note of this on your account. And I'm going to, if we have to do follow-up, I'm going to put a note in here that we need to follow up, which usually is something that would take more than 255 characters. So this would be a field that you would use when you need a lot more space for notations, but you can see the potential that it has to take up a lot of space quickly. And that's why it's used sparingly. With number data types, uh, there are different lengths of fields and different types of precision that can be held. You would not have to memorize these different formats for numbers, but I do want you to be aware that uh, up until you get to uh, single and double, there really isn't any ability for decimal precision. You're looking at integers only without any fractions or decimals. It's single and double where you finally get into the, the place where you can have longer numbers with decimal precision. And again, you know, when you're looking at how to break up your table, you are looking at making sure that you're not repeating anything. One thing that has changed in the most recent version of Access is that, and we saw this, I forgot to mention this, so let's take a look at it. With our data types, one of the options that's available is calculated. Up until this version of Access, it was not possible without a lot of programming experience to be able to put in a calculated field directly into a table. It was something that you would be putting into one of the queries that you would construct. 
Now there is the ability to add calculations directly into tables, though it is still really uh, recommended that you not put calculations into your tables unless you know what you're doing with them. And we're going to continue with that. We're, we're actually going to be putting our calculations into the queries that we write. But I do want you to be aware that that is now an option. Um, I want to take a look at what a form is, because it is one of the other options, objects that we're going to cover. I told you that if you wanted to populate a table, like the client table, you really could simply click on new record and just start entering in the new client's information, right? In doing that, when you look at this screen, there is the potential for error simply because the clutter on the screen. You've got a lot of stuff going on, and this can be an eyesore. If people are staring at this all day long, it is difficult sometimes to focus in on that one line that they're working with. So to decrease the potential for error, you do have the ability to enter records in another way. And you can create what looks like a mask that sits over the top of the table, and it's called a form. We're going to use the form wizard. So we're going to use the create tab. Anytime you want to create something new, whether it's a query, a form, a report, a table, this is your starting point for that. We're going to go to the forms grouping. We're going to select form wizard. And this will walk us through a series of really quick steps to create an automatic form. You can also create forms in design view, so you would not have the wizard. I would not recommend that unless you know uh, some of the uh, properties of objects. Some of them are bound and unbound, and it has a big impact on creating these kinds of objects in design view. So we're going to use the wizard because it, it really navigates us through all that crap. When you create a form, I mentioned to you that it's typically going to be used as a mask that sits over the top of a table. And this is important because one of the first things that you are asked when you're creating a form is, what object do you want to base this form on? And you see everything that you've created in the database, whether it be tables, queries, other forms and reports. But you're going to see all those options in there. You're almost never going to use a query to create your form. And that's just a little aside to help you through. We're going to use the client table. We're going to make a form that makes it easier to enter data into the client table. When I do that, all of the fields that are available in the client table show up. I'm going to pick all the fields to be in the form. If I'm using this form to populate the client table, if I don't put a field in the form, then people can't access it when they're trying to put in a new record. So it would be silly for me to make a form for a table and not include all the fields. The next series of steps just walk us through what the layouts could look like. And you've got some that will allow you to look at more than one record at a time. This data sheet view really isn't all that much different than looking at the actual table itself. So uh, it's not the purpose for us to go in and create a form. We want to look at something that makes it easier to look at. And there are different um, layouts and designs. We're going to let it just give that default name of client one. And then what I'm looking at right now is the form that lays over the top of this table. I can navigate through the fields. So next, next, and go last, and then new field, I mean new record. So if I wanted to add in a new record into this table, I could enter it directly into this. And after I finish home phone and I hit tab out of that, it goes into the client table. This is a very, very great way of being able to minimize errors due to eye strain, distraction, uh, and, uh, and clutter on the screen. So that's what a form is. So let's, uh, let's look for a minute at the, the object called queries, being able to ask for just certain things from a database. And we're going to spend a lot of time looking at queries, but today I'm just going to run a real quick one or two. So on the queries tab under, or grouping under create, we will click query design. And what pops up next is a dialog box that asks us, what exactly is it that you need to run this query? And you don't really know yet, because I didn't tell you what we were looking for, right? So maybe we want to run a query. Remember back in that charges table, we just had the client ID, the charge amount, and then the date? And I said, what if we want to see the last name and the first name? We can use a query to do that. So I want to get last name, first name, the client ID, the charge amount, and the charge date. I want those things. So what tables would Access need to use to grab those fields? So when I run this query, what needs to be in there in, the, in this instruction set that we're running needs to be the tables from which these fields would be pulled. So the client table is what gives us the last name and the first name. 
and the charges table is what gives us all of the charge information. Now something interesting happens, besides the fact that I just scrolled all the way over, or pulled this up. So let me just tell you, what we're looking at right now is the query design tool. The top part is what's called the design view window. So where the tables show up, that's the design view window. And the bottom area is called the QBE grid, query by design, QBE. This is where I tell Access what I want to see by giving it an example of what I want to see. Notice that the two tables that I pulled up, it kind of looks like they're holding hands. They're connected. There's a relationship. That's one of the most important things about running queries that involve multiple tables. So I'm, I'm putting you right into more of a complicated query right now. It involves several tables. When I pull tables up for a query, if there's no line between the tables, we've got issues. And so you can already get a sense for the fact that those relationships, they're going to be really important. So if I pulled these two tables up and there was no line between them, I would have to go in and do some double checking. Maybe I forgot to put the line between them. Maybe there never will be a line between them. Are these tables related? And so uh, the fields that we said we wanted, and just a real quick, uh, you know, down and dirty with this, the fields that I want, I can simply just double click on them, and they're pulled from the table into the next available slot in the QBE grid. Uh, client ID is a field that shows up in both tables. So it really doesn't matter whether I double click it from here or here. I wanted the amount, and I also wanted the charge date. At this point, I have shown access all the things that I want in my query results. I can click on the Run button, and the query will be run or, or executed. Uh, also, the, the data sheet view button that you see here, if I click on that, it does the exact same thing. So it really doesn't matter which one of these you click on. When I click on the Run button or the data sheet view button, I get all of those charges along with all of the names, last name and first names, of the people who have had papers written or, or typed. So it's that easy for me to be able to see the last name and the first name with all that charge information. I can simply run a query to do that. I can pull all of that together. So far, so good. Now, when I close this query out, we're going to call it query, um, let's just call it charges. We're going to cover up whatever was there. And we'll oh, I've, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> here's a great, here's a great lesson for you. Can't name queries and tables the same thing. Uh, and that's something that I should have thought of immediately, but didn't. So we've called it charges one. But what I want to ask you, I can see charges one right here. You see it? When I double click on it, I see the same thing I saw a minute ago, and that shouldn't surprise you. But what I want to know is. When Access is saving that query, is it saving this, the results, or is it saving this, the instructions, or both? So what is Access really saving right here? Is it the results, is it the instructions, or is it both? Come on, you know about databases, you know about some of the things that are really important to databases. What would make the most sense? What was that? Not both. Because there would be a big difference in the way in which Access would have to store those. Which one would take up more space, do you think? The instructions or the results? And imagine that we have thousands of entries. The results would take up a ton of space. So what's being saved when you save a query is this, the set of instructions, not the results. So Part of the reason is because it would take up a ton of space to save the results, but what else? What would be the other reason why it wouldn't really be all that advantageous to just save the results? Yeah, Hunter. If your data changes, when your data changes, it's always going to change. Yeah, your data is going to change. Your database is not something that you're going to create and it's done. It's going to be constantly be in the process of modification, entering records, adjusting records, deleting them. Uh, and that's always going to be happening. So yeah, what's being saved really are the instructions to rerun that query on the most recent data. 
So what about these relationships? What does all of that mean? So I was starting to talk to you about what I want to do is pull up what's called database tools. And there is something called relationships. So if I go in and look at the tables that exist within my database, I can see them, but I see a different look of the tables. I just see a box that has the table name and then the fields that are in there. And I can also see the key showing up next to those fields that were designated as primary key fields in the tables that they show up in. So these lines that, the, that connect the tables together, well, where do those come from? Well, they come from a connection between data that exists data that's the same that exists between multiple tables. So for example, in the charges table and in the client table, we see a field called client ID. That's not data redundancy, the fact that that shows up in two separate places. It's actually a strategic placement of fields that will link these two tables together. And we also see client ID showing up in the client table and in the payments table. And the fact that those fields are showing up in both tables means we've got a connection between those tables. We have a way to say to access the data that's in the payments table connects up in some way to the data in the clients table. And if we look at the payments and the payment method table, there's a common field in those tables. And it is the payment or the, the method ID or payment type. Now listen, that, that situation, the fields that are the same, they don't have the same name. Let's go back and even take a look at the tables themselves to get a, a real close look at this. So payment method, method type, payments, payment type. So the field names aren't even the same, but what's important is that the numbers within the fields, they mean the same thing. So because of that, we can create relationships, a relationship between the payments table and the, the payment methods table. What's what do you notice, besides the fact that these lines seem to be occurring between tables that have the same field in them, what else are you noticing about these relationships? Anything else? Notice anything about the keys? For every single relationship, Take, for example, between payments and payment method. The line that connects these two tables, it stops on one side at a field that is a key. And between payments and client, that line between the two tables, client ID is a primary key in one of the tables. Between charges and client, the relationship between these two tables has a primary key in the client table. For every single relationship that you establish in Access, there has to be a side of that relationship that connects to a primary key field. You cannot have a relationship without a primary key field being involved. If you want to create a relationship, in the relationships window, this is where you would go, and this is real difficult, so you got to pay real close attention. So to make a relationship between charges and client, you would click on the field that's in common and drag it and drop it right over the top of the other one. Then that makes the relationship. You might think I'm being goofy. I said it's really hard. Actually, it is really hard because when you drag and drop, it's so easy to drag and drop over the wrong thing. And uh, access is pretty dumb. Let me show you what happens. We delete out this relationship, and we say that there's a relationship between, uh, let's say, name and client ID. Access says, okay, fine, whatever. Must be a relationship between first name and client ID. Access believed me. And when I go in and try to run a query later with these two tables, I'm not going to get very good results because Access really isn't sure what the connector is between them. So you do have to be really careful with that. Are there questions before you go? All right, I'll see you next time.